He is a sensation among pitchers in the National League, but that feeling isn't new to Rick Sutcliffe. In 1979, the Los Angeles Dodgers gambled and put a young prospect into the starting rotation. 17 wins later, Sutcliffe was named the National League's Rookie of the Year, but hard times followed, only five wins the next two seasons, and then a trade to Cleveland. Once again, he was an instant hero, claiming the American League ERA title his first year as an Indian. Over two and a half years with Cleveland, he won 35 games, but the Indians needed help offensively. The Chicago Cubs were interested in a trade, but Sutcliffe was not. Uh, when I was with Cleveland and I was trying to get out, I demanded to be traded. And the first club I eliminated that I was going to go to was the Chicago Cubs. I was allowed to eliminate six, and they were the first one. I said I didn't want to go there. For a guy who was sure that he didn't want to be a Cub, he has proven to be exactly what Cubs manager Jim Fry says he's been. He's young. He's at the right age. He can throw hard. He's a good competitor. He's got all the qualities to be a winning pitcher. And he's just been... Uh, I've said it before, but it's like a godsend for our ball club. He came at the right time, and he's just been excellent. For Sutcliffe, the midseason trade was hard personally, but great professionally. I left a lot of close friends in Cleveland, and that part I do miss. But the, the part of losing, I don't miss at all. It's a great opportunity for me to be here. Uh, I stepped into a ball club that had a five-game lead. I left a ball club that was 25 games out. So far, it has worked his way. His 13-1 record good enough that he has jumped to the top of the Cy Young list. But Sutcliffe thinks his record might be deceiving. They have scored a lot of runs for me. Uh, I won one ball game 13 to 11. I won another game uh, 8 to 6. So a lot of the games haven't been pretty, but uh, you know the bottom line is we've won, and uh, I've just been real fortunate since I've been here. Even if that is true, Sutcliffe can't help but marvel at his success. Without a doubt, uh, I've never done it before. I never pitched like that in high school. And, uh, I felt like I dominated high school as, as much as any league I've ever been in. Sutcliffe and the Cubs are now trying to conquer the world, and all that's missing from making this match a marriage is a ring. Uh, I think everybody's ultimate goal in baseball is that World Series ring, and hopefully this time around I'll get one that I can wear. What an addition he has been. Sutcliffe, of course, only one of 25 or so reasons why the Cubs are on top again tomorrow night. We'll take a close look at the other maneuverings of Dallas Green, and he has been a busy man for the last few years. And it sure is paying off. Doesn't matter anymore, thanks to a fellow by the name of Dallas Green. In the second of a two-part series, CNN's Terry Chick takes a closer look. I think we finally realized, uh, maybe beginning of the season, maybe the all-star break when we had a lead and we were playing good, that everybody says, hey, we got a good team. I mean, if you look at this team in spring training, we did not have a good team. But there can be no mistaking the fact that Chicago Cubs now are indeed a very good team. Two trades this season turned them around. Now, trading is an awful lot like a flip of a coin. Heads you win, but tails you lose. Well, it was heads back in March and heads again in June. General Manager Dallas Green realized back in spring training the Cubs needed defensive help in the outfield. So where else to turn but to his old club, the Phillies. Green shipped off reliever Bill Campbell and welcomed Gary Matthews and Bob Dernier, two good gloves and bats. The Cubs now nearly bursting at the seams with ex-Phillies. We've got a lot of guys who have been through a pennant race, people who are experienced, veterans who have played on real good clubs, so I think that helps. We don't really um, uh, count on one particular guy in our lineup in order to make us win. Matthews started slowly, but is now closing in on a 300 season. Denier, the perfect leadoff man, was on a tear early. He's tapered off at 290. Now trade number two, and it's a dandy. Middle of June, two Chicago frontline pitchers on the disabled list. Dallas Green goes to work again. Picks up Rick Sutcliffe from the Indians for two promising outfielders. With a month ago, Sutcliffe has ruled off 11 straight victories. He wanted out of Cleveland, and despite a 4-5 and five record there, Dallas Green saw a winner. The bearded redhead, though. Uh, when I was with Cleveland and I was trying to get out, I demanded to be traded. And the first club I eliminated that I was going to go to was the Chicago Cubs. I was allowed to eliminate six, and they were the first one. I said I didn't want to go there. So basically, that shows you where they come from. Where the Cubs have come from is the cellar. Perennial losers to the toast of the town all in two and a half seasons under Dallas Green, and the Cubs have done it through the trade. I stepped into a ball club that had a five-game lead. I left a ball club that was 25 games out. Uh, I picked up 30 games in one night. With a roster of 25, only four are of the homegrown variety. Tomorrow night, we'll take a... Wired from Cleveland, June 14th, in a trade that can only be called a steal. Sutcliffe has gone 13-1 and one with his last 11 decisions, all being victories. Now, before he was traded from Cleveland, his ERA was well over five. He had won four and lost five. I asked him about the dramatic turnaround. For one thing, people don't realize that I had some uh, physical problems. Uh, I had a root canal done. Uh, I lost almost 20 pounds, and 
I got off to a good start in Cleveland, but when I came down with that, I just I wasn't the same guy. And it took a while for me to get my strength back. And uh, you know, I, my record's deceiving over here. I, I'm playing for a great ball club. They're, they play great defensively. They score a lot of runs. And when you get a combination like that, you're supposed to win. His teammates certainly appreciate what he's done for them. But he's the uh, the man on the pitching staff, and you know he's meant a lot to this ball club and to the pitching staff itself. Uh, you know, every time he goes out there, it seems like uh, it's a situation where we could use a win, or it's, you know, so-called a big win, and he goes out there and uh, and pitches uh, his best, and uh, he's an outstanding pitcher. Tell me a little about Rick Sutcliffe and what he's added to this ball club. <laughs> he's added about uh, 12, 13 victories is what he's done. He's been uh, our stopper here, without a doubt, and when we've had tough ball games to where we had to go out there and win, he's been the guy that has... Um, gone out there and done that job for us and you always need that type of guy on a pitching staff when you have rough moments that he can go out there and have that momentum go the other way and um, he didn't pitch really a great ball game in Cincinnati the game that he lost but we did win that and uh, we feel that when he's out there on the mound that we're going to win. Pitching coach Billy Connors can't find anything wrong with Sutcliffe. He's got four pitches and he's consistent with all four and, uh, and he can get them over the plate you know at any time and get people out that's he's in the groove right now and uh, He's, he's, you know, he's very confident, and he goes out there and he gives you a great effort every time out. So if Rick Sutcliffe continues his amazing pitching, the Cinderella Cubs certainly won't turn to the pumpkins this year. In Philadelphia, Mike Forrest for ESPN. This Friday. Game road trip, a couple of your pennant season veterans took charge to lead the Cubs to a 7-4 record. First, let's talk about the Sarge, Gary Matthews. He really got hot in Atlanta for starters. Well, I can tell you this. To that, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about Gary Matthews when he cooled off along about the middle of the year. But the thing that I liked about Gary Matthews is when I check back on a regular basis, Gary Matthews would do something to keep an inning going, something to help us win a ball game. Even if it's a base on balls or hit the ball behind the runner, uh, he did those little things that you'd like to get out of a player. On this particular trip, and, and not only this trip, but for the last month, Gary Matthews has been one of our hot hitters. He's gotten a lot of clutch hits on this road trip. He, there were three or four ball games where he got the big base hit for. Now we are looking at the series in Atlanta. That single in the game on Saturday against Rick Camp gave the Cubs a 1-0 lead. Here he doubles to left field off of Camp, top of the ninth to break a 1-1 uh, tie to set the stage that 4-1 victory. That, well, this was a big series for us. You know, this started our, our uh, road trip. We had four games in Atlanta, and we went in there. It didn't, we really weren't hitting the ball well as a team. But Gary Matthews made the difference in this series. Gary, and I think it's about the time that Ron Say started to get hot. He got a couple of clutch hits for us also. You know, I can remember some of the previous Jim Fry shows, a lot of second guessers questions. Why, why do we continue to use Gary Matthews? All you have to do is look at the man's August and September stats. No matter where he's played, he has always come through in the clutch. Well, I think that's true. That's correct. He is one of those fellas that I've said several times on this program. He seems to be able to do what it takes in a game situation. He's got great instinct and feel for the game. Saturday against the Met, this home run against uh, Walt Terrell gave the Cubs uh, their only victory in that series, 6-1. to And again, the Sarge providing the power here, coming up with an RBI single, really to put that game away. This was a big hit right there. I think we had a two-run lead at that time. And he got that base hit to right field late in the ball game to give us a little cushion. Uh, he's been a tremendous offensive player for us all year. He had that one period for about a month where he struggled. Other than that, he's been super. And Jim, as you alluded to, when it wasn't Gary Matthews, it was Ron Say. Jim, uh, Ron seemed to have especially good success against the Phillies at Veterans Stadium this season. We're going to take a look at, at some of that uh, Labor Day weekend uh, series against the Phillies. Early on against John Denny, you're going to see Big Ronnie uh, hit a home run, and the Penguin has really been pouring on the RBIs this year. Well, he his RBIs were pretty good early, even though his batting average went down, and, and he has not had a high batting average for most of the season. But he's up in home runs, he's up in RBIs. As a matter of fact, this may end up being one of his strongest years in terms of RBIs. Uh, for the last five or six weeks, Ronnie Say has probably been our consistent guy for the big extra base hit the home run he's he's given us a lot of big cushions with those two and three run home runs 
And this is something that he didn't do earlier in the year. He's hit a lot of balls up the middle, right center to drive in key runs for it. Earlier in the year, it looked like he was pulling off the ball, trying to pull everything to left field. But Say and Matthews, both of them, uh, as you said, two veterans, they kind of carried us through this last road trip. Well, that last single off of lefty Carlton and this two-run homer he hit in the same game gave the uh, Cubbies the cushion. Uh, is it one of baseball's strange phenomena? but why are particular players, why do they do well against certain teams? That was Ron's sixth home run of the year against the Phillies this season. Uh, well, I, I think what it is is a certain style of pitching that suits a guy's style of hitting. You, you can run against some, some clubs where they have uh, their pitching staff just isn't conducive to your style of, of hitting. And if they pop that ball in areas where you don't like it, you're not going to hit. Uh, you can run into the next club, and, and they got a different style of pitches. For instance, high ball pitches versus sinker slider guys, and, and the guy get red hot. And perhaps the most amazing thing about Ron, his ability to withstand pain. He's had those troubled wrists uh, virtually all season long, yet day in, day out. He told me earlier in the locker room in Philadelphia that he has a, a, an ability to, to kind of put it in the back of his mind and he doesn't think about it at all. I can tell you this, if you're close to him down on the field and you see him hit, you can see him kind of wince almost every swing that he takes. This guy's been playing for uh, at least two months, maybe longer, with a sore right wrist. And he had a sore left wrist for half of that time. It was about the time that he had both wrists taped up that he got hot, though. And I think he's one of those guys, you know, he seems to be a very unemotional player, and he seems to be able to key himself up. He's a very determined, uh, proud type of ball player, and I think that he, uh, he wears those bandages and likes, likes to be thought of as a tough player, and, and he is. Okay, we've talked about Sarge, we've talked about Ron Say, one of the real constants with the Cubs this year has been their solid defense, and once again, especially in those tight pitching duels in Atlanta, the fielders came up with the big plays, especially Larry Boa. Well, you know, we have talked all year long about our defense, and uh, some people criticized our defense for lack of range, but there are two ways to look at this. We've got Boa and Say, who almost never miss a ball that they get to, almost never miss it, and almost never throw a ball away. So in terms of making the routine plays, I think our ball club probably does that better than anybody in our league. Well, Sandberg, of course, never misses a ball. Durham has played well. Dernier is outstanding. The Sarge had some moments early in the year, but in the last couple of months, the Sarge has played well. Keith Moreland doesn't run fast, but he's a very steady, dependable outfielder. We have really minimized the number of mistakes we've made on defense. Now, a terrific play by Larry right here, and just like Gary Matthews, a lot of fans down on Larry, but the man is worth to being in the lineup every day when he can play defense like this. Another great play here by Ron Say. Well, well, uh, yeah, Ronnie, of course, we talked about a moment ago. He's played great. If he gets to the ball, he catches it, and he doesn't, he's got a very accurate arm, not the strongest, but very accurate. And, and Boa, I, I really think that Boa about three weeks ago or so, maybe a little longer, uh, is almost like he put the afterburner on. He, he, uh, he looks to me like he's moving better, running better, and uh, he's just played super here recently. And I don't know if there's a better center fielder in baseball playing right now than Bob DeNier, the thinking man center fielder. Never well, out of position. You, I don't think that I've ever seen anybody can go farther for a fly ball. This guy is in the upper class in terms of sheer speed. He's got good hands. Uh, he knows how to play situations. He moves on counts. He moves depending on who the pitcher is. He, you say a thinking man's outfielder. He is that with outstanding speed. There's Larry Boa's great cutoff throw to Jody Davis. Terrific defense during that uh, road trip. Seven and four, the final count. And of course, the Cubs looking pretty good right now. In a moment, you fans will take over the questioning when we return. So stay with us, everyone. Yes, my name is Joe Spencer, and I'm from Tinley Park. And my question is for Jim Fry. I'd like to know why he um, designated Jay Johnson for reassignment. He's a good veteran player. I'd just like to know why he did that. Thank you. We had to make a room for Davy Lopes. We thought we had a need for another right-handed hitter on the bench. Also, Davy Lopes provides 
insurance at second base and third base should Sandberg or Say get hurt. Uh, this guy's been a great offensive player for a long time. So we had to make a decision that came down between uh, John Stone and a couple of our other younger guys. Uh, age probably was the factor right there. Jay is uh, 38 or 39 years old. He's been bothered with uh, little physical problems on and off all year. We just thought youth was better. Uh, we could use the youth and the speed better on our team at this time. One other thing about that 25-man player roster, now you will have to go back to that come playoff time. Right now, we have the 25 players that finished the month of August. As of August 31st, we had to have 25 players on a list, and that's when we added Lopes. You also add the number of players that are on the disabled list. In our case, we got uh, Ruschel, Hebner, and Hasse. So right now, our pool for the playoffs, we have 25, uh, 28 players, and we can choose 25 uh, as late as uh, September 30th. Okay, when you made the acquisition of Davy Lopes, several people called to ask how you might fit him into the lineup. Well, I played him. I'm Ben Gaston from Chicago. I have a question for Jim Fry. Being that Sandberg came up originally as a shortstop, would you consider putting Sandberg at shortstop and Lopes at second? <laughs> you know, that's a thought. I mean, this is not an original thought, this question. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you got a guy that's playing as good as Sandberg is, and has played that way for two years. He hasn't been at shortstop for three years, as a matter of fact. Uh, it'd be kind of risky to put him over at shortstop, and I, I don't believe in juggling people around when they're doing as well as Ryan is right now. Uh, uh, I think it's a very reasonable uh, question, uh, thinking in terms of trying to put some offense into the ball club. But uh, I don't expect people are going to be experimenting too much with Ryan Sandberg. Okay. Well, now a question about your game strategy in that one game you lost in Atlanta in the bottom of the ninth inning. Hello, my name is Jerry Winters from Chicago, Illinois. And my question is about the point in which the Cubs lost to the Atlanta Braves, 3-2 to two Friday night. And I was wondering why Jim Fry did not have the players back for the double play from second to first. Well, that's also a good question. You have a choice there, whether or not you want to gamble and take a chance on a double play. If you, there's one out and you got the winning run, bases loaded, uh, uh, Murphy's a big hitter. We know he's a big hitter. He also hits the ball to right field. If he makes the second baseman go to his left a little bit, it's tough making the double play. He's a good runner. Uh, if you play deep and a guy hits a ball that's not hit hard, you have no chance for the double play. I t in my judgment, it didn't work out that night, but in my judgment, we were taking the least amount of risk by playing in. Jim, just like the Davy Lopes questions, we've had a lot of fans call in after the dispute over Al Oliver's bat during the Labor Day game in Philadelphia. Here's one of them. This is Kevin Schmidt from Buffalo Grove. I was wondering about the play on September 3rd where Al Oliver hit the double and Jody Davis said that it was a loaded bat. When um, Jim Fry went out there, was he arguing about the fact that the home plate umpire gave the bat to the Phillies bench or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got it right. We, uh, what I said to Proby was that uh, you got a, an accused player here doing something illegal and you handed the evidence to his manager. And the chances of you ever getting that bat back are nil. I mean, <laughs> we, we gave them an opportunity. The kid in the dugout took the bat. I saw him run up the, the runway towards the dugout, I mean, towards the clubhouse. And I went back on the mound and protested. And I told Bruce Fromey, the umpire, I said, you have absolutely no chance of ever seeing that same piece of wood again. <laughs> so I knew that we were lost. Uh, as it turns out, we won the game, and at the, after the game, I really didn't care. And if the shoe was on the other foot, Jody Davis was saying, there's, there's no way you'd have returned the bat either. Well, that goes without saying. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Jim, we have a question dealing with your pitching rotation. Hello. My name is Larry Marshall, Chicago, Illinois. Since Bordy is doing so good, why don't you put him as a starter and put... Bruce and on the bench as a for 
One of the things that you have to realize when you have somebody in the bullpen is their ability to get hot, their ability to get up and get down, their ability to throw uh, maybe two, three, four days in a row when the ball club's uh, struggling a little bit. That is, these are the qualities that you want in a relief pitcher. Uh, some of the guys, like, like a Ruthven, who has not uh, been doing that or hasn't done it in a while and has had some physical problems this year, wouldn't be able to adjust on a regular basis to the bullpen. It would take him a, it would take him a lot of time. And Bordy has done such a good job. It's like I said about Sandberg. If you got a guy in a spot where he's doing you a good job, you kind of hesitate to start moving the pieces around. Okay, one last question here, and it's about Bobby Denier's performance at the plate. Hi, my name is Jim Ball. I'm from hometown of Donald Goldman. I've noticed that Bobby Denier has been slipping at the plate, and I would just like to, well, his average has dropped about 40 points. He was at batting three, about 320. Now it's down about 280. I'd like to ask Jim Fry, why has his average slumped so much? Well, this is one of the mysteries of the world, why people go into slumps and hitting a guy. That, uh, Bobby had about, I would say, the better part of four months that he was hitting very consistently for us. And then he went into a, a slump, and he has dropped. That's true. Uh, he takes extra hitting. Of course, John Vukovic uh, works with him. He uh, uh, has been trying to do some things. He moved closer to the plate. They move away from the plate. They try different mechanical uh, changes. Uh, I think it's, uh, I always get back to the mental part of baseball. I'm not a big believer in the mechanics as much as some people. And I think that sometimes players get into mental ruts. And uh, now in the last few days, Bobby's helped us with the bat. So I'm hoping he's ready to go on another high. Okay. In a moment, Jim and I will be back to talk about the man who may well be the National League's most valuable player after we take this final timeout. Stay with us. Half a dozen important statistics, one of them that is often overlooked, is runs scored. Ryan is the league leader in uh, the top run score of the National League, and I think, Jim, that's really one of his most significant statistics, especially when you consider he's really not doing it with a lot of singles hitting and walks. Well, uh, I think that his extra base power is really the, the, uh, the thing that has probably set him up this year versus uh, a year ago, he's way up in runs scored. He's still got a chance to maybe score another 10 or 12. Uh, hitting 19 home runs and 17 triples and 30-some doubles just puts him in a position to, to score more easily, more often. And with the big guys we have behind him, that's what it is. Also, we're talking about a guy that, that uh, has stolen, uh, what, 40 bases. So, I mean, he's the perfect number two man. And when I say perfect, I'm talking about a, a guy, for me at least, that can hit 19, 20 home runs. People always want to go back to that conversation, apparently, that you two of you had about him driving the ball this season. Yes. Well, I just tried to explain to him uh, in game situations and certain counts against certain pitchers and have a little bit of an idea what pitches to look for and try to hit the ball hard versus just trying to make contact. Okay, well, we're in the middle of the stretch run, of course. Given your druthers and talking about Ryan Sandberg, one last quick thought. Would you like to see the Cubs clinch it here in Wrigley? I would. I'd love to see us do it here. There are some people who question that because uh, they're afraid they'll tear up Wrigley Field, but I think it'd be fun. Okay. Well, we'll keep you to it. If not, we'll see you in St. Louis. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jim. That's it for this edition of the Jim Fry Show. Next week, Tim will be back with White Sox manager Tony La Russa. Until then, so long, everybody.
And I'm Mike Danably along with Jim Rose, and we are here to celebrate one of the greatest nights in Cub history. And Jimmy, what a game this evening. I know you followed the Cubs during their dog days this summer. I think even back in June, you knew that there was something special about this I had team. an idea that it would happen. You know, in April, I was the clown that said that, uh, don't, don't worry about the Cubs this year. It's the Sox you're going to have to worry about to repeat <laughs> his American League West Championship. So I guess I've got to eat a little bit of crow tonight. And thankfully so, I want to eat about 10 pounds of that stuff because the Cubs did win, and it's been a special moment for me following them through the dog days of summer where they really didn't have an idea that they would do this thing. Mm -hmm. But then just around August when they turned the corner, I think they had an idea they knew where they were going to win it. And tonight's celebrations everywhere. You know, for six long days, the magic number held at three. But the Cubs knocked it down to one yesterday. Then tonight, they clinched it. Their first title of any kind in 39 years. For Cub fans everywhere, let the celebration begin. Tim Weigel is in Pittsburgh and was in the midst of the party there, and this is how it all began. Yes, the Cubs did clinch it tonight, and Jimmy, what a satisfying win it was. It's a shame, you know, that the Cubs did not clinch the championship here in Chicago, but let's not get picky. They did clinch, and Pittsburgh was as good a place as any, so let's go back to Pittsburgh Live. It was the pitch heard around the world. Rick Sutcliffe striking out Joe Ursulak, and the moment Chicago had longed for since most of us were born was here. The Cubs had clinched the National League East title at 8.46 p.m. Chicago time. And while there may have been no joy in Mudville, there was nothing but elation in Pittsburgh, Chicago, and everywhere else there are Chicago Cub fans. And on Monday night, there were Cub fans all over the world. <laughs> We've had a good year, and we've won a pennant. I've been here for three years, and I have the same people, and they're right there cheering us no matter what happens. And what I want to say to them is look at you and says, God bless you. We've done one thing out of three. We're going to do two more. I heard that. We haven't, we haven't done anything until we popped it two more times. Yeah. I'm happy right now, and hey, this guy got to keep on blessing us, man. We got to go all the way. You can really... you get it in your eyes? Yeah. Where is my what? Oh, we're on. <laughs> oh, Here, we're I'm on. talking to Jay. Hey, he's got the, uh, the bottle of champagne. I didn't know we were on so fast. This is it. Isn't this something? Uh, it, it, Ye old bath water. Yeah, it doesn't taste very good, but it sure <laughs> squirts a long way. Yeah, and it really burns the eyes, too. Well, we're going to be back with some more of this... Uh, levity here from Pittsburgh. And as a matter of fact, we've got some very important things to deal with. We're going to review the entire Cub season. But in the meantime, Jim and Mike, back to you in the studio, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, thank you, Jay, and thank you, Timmy. And you know, there were a th few thousand fans in Pittsburgh celebrating tonight, but here in Chicago, well, thousands of fans are in the midst of the Cub victory party. We have, and we have had all night long, reporters all over the city. Uh, we have been on Rush Street, we have been at Wrigley Field, and right now we're going to go to Jay Levine, who is standing by live on Rush Street, and the scene is absolutely crazy there, and I know it still is, right, Jay? <laughs> yeah, it really is, Mike. As Tim said, they are dancing in the streets, and still dancing in the streets. Still several thousand strong. They're spraying a good amount of beer and wine, drinking some of it, too. It's a happy crowd, in the uh, words of one police officer assigned to the scene, although one that he said about an hour ago was pretty close to being completely out of control. And while police and other officials this afternoon were downplaying the possibility of any trouble, one bar manager we spoke to earlier this evening seemed to hit it right on the head. Well, people are drinking a little bit more tonight than they normally do, and obviously they're all in the party and mood, so they're getting a little drunk, that's what it amounts to. And when and if? If they clinch, the place will go up for grabs, there's no doubt about it. It may not have been 39 years of celebration rolled into one, but it built and built fast, until eight police officers had all they could handle with several thousand revelers. Illinois Senator Charles Percy campaigning for re-election was one of them. Four years ago, the Cubs were in last place. Today, they're in first place. We're the winners. Also four years ago, Voodoo Economics was a campaign slogan. Voodoo Dolls are playing a key role in tonight's celebration. I came in from San Francisco on the 10th with my Met Voodoo doll. I take all responsibilities for those five losses last week because I prematurely put a Padres shirt on them. 
but it paid off in the long run. We're getting ready to stick it in the golden arches. Well, he worked up the crowd before, and they're worked up again, just the sight of a TV light, actually. The crowd's thinning out somewhat. All the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm is not diminishing any. And uh, Mike and Jim, I think what I'm going to do now, after being sprayed by some champagne, even two stories up, is put on this Cub T-shirt and uh, join the party. Live at State and Division, I'm Jay Levine, Channel 7 Eyewitness to you. Well, Jay, I'm glad you're going to finally unloosen that tie a little bit and get down. I'm, you know, I'm really sorry that we are stuck in this studio. I, I'd like to get some, can we send out and get some champagne to be, you know, we can do it. You and I other. are going out afterwards. Absolutely. You know, Jay had the presence of mind at least to be up nice and high. Yeah, and we'll have more <laughs> of the Cubs post-game celebration when we return right after these messages. Now it's time to show you how the Cubs clinched it tonight. With Rick Sutcliffe on the mound, the Cubs knew tonight was their night, their date with destiny. After Ryan Sandberg's yeah, first inning double the stars, Gary Matthews continued his hot September hitting a single to left center. It brought home Rhino and the Cubs led 1-0 in the second. Pitcher Rick Sutcliffe singles off of second baseman Johnny Ray's glove. Larry Boa scores. The Cubs led 2-zip. In the third, Keith Moreland will lay down this nice bunt. But Pittsburgh third baseman and former White Sox Jimmy Morrison will throw it away past Jason Thompson. Sandberg scored to make it 3-0 Chicago. Meanwhile, Sutcliffe was outstanding. He gave up just one run, pitched a brilliant two-hitter. Here he fans Thompson, one of nine strikeouts for the man, certain to be the Cy Young Award winner. And when a Pirate gets on base, Sutcliffe picks him off here. Joe Orselek is the victim in the sixth inning. Finally, the bottom of the ninth with two outs. Orselick is the victim again as Sutcliffe fans him for the game's final out, giving the Cubs the National League Eastern Division title. The rest is history. We've told you about the celebration all night long. First title since 1949. And we all right, finally we got it. it. Can we do a high five? Yeah, yeah a high five right on Jim. Okay. <laughs> now, let us go back to Pittsburgh where Tim Weigel is standing by. He says he's still got a little bit of champagne on his hair, and he's going to talk a little bit more about this victory and the team that deserved to win this thing. Let's go back now live to Pittsburgh and Tim Weigel. Tim? Jim, I do feel sorry for you and Mike stuck there in the studio, and I wish I could be with you all tonight to share this glorious moment. You know, the Chicago Cub players are as high as this Pittsburgh sky, but it's not because of the champagne. It's because they finally removed that stigma of 39 years of losing. We've been waiting for this for about uh, 10 days or a week, and, uh, you know, it seemed like uh, that magic number, number three, it took a long time to win three games. It's like, uh, like a month out there, but, you know, big relief right now. Well, I just want to say thank the people of Chicago for all their support. Anytime you draw two million people with television every single day and all-day baseball, they deserve every minute of what they're getting right now. I hope they're celebrating down on Rush Street because... Maybe the celebration is just starting in October. They can really celebrate. The uh, 69 ball club probably owes us a great debt. Uh, we have relieved the world's uh, problems off their shoulders. And, uh, you know, I want you to know we've had to live with that for quite a while. You know, it's funny. You clinch the pennant or the division in front of about 5,500 people uh, out on the road here. It's a little bit different than it is uh, in Wrigley Field. I know. It doesn't matter because we're going to have a good time anyway. So it doesn't matter if we're in Pittsburgh, Cleveland, or wherever. Here we are, you know. I have never been associated with people, even uh, Texas fans, Arkansas Razorback fans, and where I, I play college football, which are very intense, but I've never seen fans that really, and honest to God, wanted their team to do good more than anything in the world. I'm pleased for the city of Chicago. I'm pleased for all of the Cub fans all over the world, and I can't express how happy I am. It's wonderful. I thought this one would be like the last one, but it's not. It's better. Is it that really right? is better. It honestly is better. <laughs> I can't help it. It's better. Uh, it's better. It's the best. You know, Keith Moreland was talking about the Cub fans. Kim Peterson, of course, was with the Cub fans tonight in the stands. It's a shame that only about 5,000 of them could be here to experience this. But, boy, those 5,000 that were here oh, really had a night to remember. They were roaring and rocking. I'm going to trade you. I'll give you this, and I'll, I'll take I'll, care of the mic. I'll gladly trade you. Know, you. There, were, there were, what, five, 6,000 fans in the stands tonight. But from the looks of it and the feeling and the excitement here tonight, it looked as though 90% of them had to be Cub fans. They came here from a long way to be here for this win tonight. Hey! 
You'd think this was Wrigley Field with all the Cubs hats, banners, signs, and of course the t-shirts. And many of them came at the last minute all the way from Chicago just to watch the game that made their dreams come true. This is so great. I've been waiting for so long for this. I can't believe I'm actually here. We came here from Northern Illinois University. It took us nine and a half hours. I hope that far. We drove. And how you feeling now that the Cubs have won this thing here? It's great. It's great. We're going to go back real happy. It's about time. Yeah. Jeez. We just decided to get on a plane, and at 4 o'clock, I happened to have a pair of Levi's in my car, and we changed and went to the, right to the airport, and we're going back tomorrow morning. Many of them are students who drove in groups from Northern Illinois University, Southern Illinois, Notre Dame, Purdue, all day on the road to be here. No more talk of magic numbers. The only magic number is 1984. No more wondering where they'd clinch it. It's here now, and the fans love it. This is it. This is the year. I mean, words can't really describe it. What I think is really important is that I was born on the day the Cubs last won the pennant, September 24, 1945. And today, ladies and gentlemen, happens to be my birthday. The day they clinched the division. I flew here today from Muskegon, Michigan to watch this game and witness my rebirth. <laughs> His rebirth. Well, you can tell the celebration here. This pretty much sums up the uh, party that's been going on in Three River Stadium tonight, although the fans have cleared out their party in the streets here, too, as well. It was, a, it was a great night. It was really a terrible shame for such a small crowd. I thought more folks would show up, even to watch the Cubs beat the Pirates and clinch it tonight. But the fans who were here, uh, boy, you could tell, they were just real excited. This was a really great game and a great, great event for Pittsburgh. You can <laughs> There's still hear them up there. I mean, what is this killer bee attack here? Oh, you, you know, know it's, it's going to be the cleanest stadium in America after this is all. We're finished. lucky they left the lights on for us. We'd be here <laughs> sitting in the dark, folks. I can tell you that. We had to pay good money a, to leave those lights uh, on. Uh, that was a great night, though. It, it really was fun here tonight, and the fans are still partying, and the players will be going on. Like Jay said, if they get nine guys show up in uniform tomorrow, they'll be playing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's toss it back to Chicago. Jay and I still have more work to do back here before we can celebrate. We're going to review the entire 1984 Cubs season. But first, Mike and Jim, you have business to take care of back home. Thank you, Tim and Kim. There were a few thousand fans in Pittsburgh celebrating tonight, but there were hundreds of thousands of Chicagoans here and in the midst of a Cub victory party, we had reporters all over the city to cover Cub mania, including Joel Daly, and here's his report. The celebration began over two hours ago. It's been building for 39 years. Most of the celebrants weren't even born the last time the Cubs won a pennant. As you can see, they're young, they're vital, and they are excited. In fact, the excitement got a little out of hand when uh, several hundred people decided to climb on the ledge overhanging the main gate. There was concern that it might collapse. And a few folks uh, started playing Tarzan off the flagpole when the police decided that perhaps the camera crews should depart. There was an obvious effort to play for the camera, to perform, to be seen and to be heard, but perhaps that's natural. Cub fans have felt so ignored for so long, they wanted to show how they felt. There is a little irony involved in this massive celebration tonight. This, after all, is the neighborhood that for so many years has complained about parking and noise and resisted the installation of lights to keep things quiet after dark. Well, it's far from quiet tonight. There's no going to bed early. And you know what? No one's complaining. I have never seen when the Cubs opened spring training in Mesa, Arizona last March, no pennant miracles appeared to be in sight. In fact, the Northsiders dropped 11 straight exhibition games, and their fans began to wonder if they could even stay ahead of the lowly Mets, who'd finished behind them in last place in 1983. But new manager Jim Fry did not seem to be concerned. As I told everybody, I don't think the people believe me. But I told them that our record in spring training was the result of a manager who didn't care about winning spring training games. However, Fry and general manager Dallas Green did see a need for outfield help, and they traded with who else? The Philadelphia Phillies. Bob Dernier came over to play center field, and it meant instant improvement in the Cubs pitching staff. All of a sudden, balls that had been dropping in for singles, doubles, and even triples became harmless outs. And Gary Matthews, who had occasional difficulties in left field, added timely hitting, leadership, and enthusiasm. The outfield additions allowed the Cubs to move Leon Durham to first base, leaving the popular Bill Buckner as the odd man out. By early May, the Cubs had taken first place in the National League East, winning a succession of high-scoring games in their final at-bats. A hero a day was the Cub formula as they pulled off one miracle finish after another. 
but doubters persisted. They pointed out that Cub pitching was the team's Achilles heel, and disabling injuries to Dick Ruthven and Scott Sanderson did not help the situation. So as June approached, Cub management made another move. We're definitely going to miss the Cubs. And, uh, I'm looking forward to Boston. <laughs> Dennis Eckersley started his first game against the Reds two days later, but that milestone was lost in the events that followed. A four-game sweep by the Phillies in mid-June at Wrigley exposed the team's pitching weaknesses. The visitors scored 33 runs on 47 hits during the weekend romp, but at the same time, general manager Dallas Green was making a move, a critical move, trading Mel Hall to Cleveland for pitcher Rick Sutcliffe. We feel that the addition of the two pitchers is necessary at this time for our staff. And uh, this was the one guy that Cleveland insisted upon. Late July found an unlikely showdown for first place in the NL East as the Cubs met the Mets, who had led them by three and a half games as the series began. Rookie strikeout sensation Dwight Gooden KO'd the Cubs in the opener, but in the pivotal second game, the Cub defense came to the rescue and shut off a Met rally, and Cub bats exploded for three runs in the next inning to put away the decision, perhaps their biggest win of the season. The next day, in a doubleheader, the Cubs showed more of the right stuff. On the mound, first Steve Trout, and then Scott Sanderson throttled the Mets. And when the day had ended, the Cubs had closed within a game and a half with a long homestand in the friendly confines about to begin. On August 6th, the Mets came into Wrigley Field only a half game behind. But New York's strong young pitching staff never knew what hit them as balls flew off Cub bats in, around, and out of Wrigley Field during a four-game Cub sweep. I'd like to be in my fifth World Series, uh, but, you know, right now, all we're trying to do is uh, continue to improve on our lead uh, against everybody else in the National League East. And uh, when it gets time to, uh, to get down and uh, get excited, we'll do that. It was Matthews and Say who took command in a pressure-packed road trip that began August the 30th. Matthews drove in key runs in Atlanta, and Say hit home runs that proved the demise of two of the best Philly pitchers during a series sweep that knocked the defending champions out of the race. Then it was on to New York, where the Mets needed a sweep to draw close. They got two out of three, but Sutcliffe's shutout gave the Cubs the big one they really needed. And you can't avoid saying this guy's a stop for 14 and one. I think it's good enough. The Cubs returned home needing only to avoid a long losing streak in order to win the division. And the Cubs kept feeding on opponents' misplays to pile up more victories. When the Mets visited for a final showdown, the New Yorkers needed a miracle, and they didn't get it. Rick Sutcliffe showed them early on that this Cub team was not about to give them even one single chance. And Jody Davis's Grand Slam home run provided the coup de grace. It was time for Cub fans to begin celebrating in earnest and await the clinching of the team's first division title and their first championship of any kind in 39 long-suffering years. Well, this is what the Chicago Cub franchise used to look like a few years ago, maybe many years ago, whatever. Dallas Green took some refuse, uh, the, the tired and the poor, and then he got some studs. The old, the young. That's right, and he put together a franchise that is truly outstanding. You're talking about Rick Sutcliffe, who is now, what, 16 and 1? And he's won 14 games in a row, and he's 20 game winner now, including his Cleveland victories. You pick somebody like that up in the middle of the year, and that's really a tremendous job for Dallas Green. Well, I, I don't think he gets enough credit in, in what he's done because, like, uh, Dallas is very, uh, very front. Uh, where, I mean, he just straight from the hip, he tells it like it is. A lot of people resent that. Mm -hmm. But what he's done for this ball club is, is as a player, when we lost two guys in Sanderson and Rufin, and now we're struggling a little bit, here's a guy that goes out and backs us up by getting his two quality pitchers. And I think, you know, from a player standpoint, you say, oh, here, it's a general manager in the front office that's behind us. I mean, they want to yeah. win as bad as we do. So when they got those guys, I mean, that really, to us, made all the difference as players. I'm sure it did. And, you know, I can understand why, but I saw Dallas Green smile more tonight than I've seen him smile in about three and a half years. Dallas Green was really kind of loose and relaxed, and uh, when he lets the intensity down, you know it's a special night. Well, it is a special night all over Chicago, all over the world, because the Chicago Cubs are, in many respects, not only America's team, but the world's team, and we're going to have more thoughts on the world's team when we come back to Pittsburgh. But meanwhile, let's go back to Chicago. And Jim Rose and Mike Adamley, how are you doing, guys? Tim, That's you really think gentlemen. you're watching the Cubs in Moscow tonight? I bet they are, you know. I mean, why not? <laughs> the world's team. <laughs> All right, Timmy. Well, we've shown you fans celebrating in Pittsburgh, the fans celebrating in the city. Now let's go out to Tim Ryan, who is standing by live at Myers Tavern in suburban Glenview. Tim? And this is a very upscale neighborhood. These are the North Shore suburbs. 
We're in fact right on the border of Wilmette and Glenview. And it's pretty obvious to me, I hope it's obvious to you, that this is a very sophisticated crowd taking it all in stride. Myers Tavern normally packs them in for Monday night football, but just this once, football was not the most important game in town. It was the Cubs. Now it's fashionable to be a Cubs fan, but what about all those years of cheering for the also-rans of the National League? Are you a real Cubs fan, or are you just a Cubs fan for this year? No, always and ever. <laughs> Has it been frustrating the past couple of years? Yes, those my playoff tickets. <laughs> I never thought they'd do it. Honestly. You lost the faith? Yeah, for a while there. <laughs> now, if you can't win a million dollars in the lottery, perhaps your second most burning desire would be for playoff tickets. I wish I could have been there. Have you got tickets for the playoffs? No, but I sent my card in several times. About 13 times I sent in, hoping to get a ticket. How much would you pay? What would you give to get a playoff ticket? My firstborn child. No. <laughs> no. These fans cannot get enough of it. Every time, every time they see a replay, and we've been seeing them all night of the Cubs, they start cheering. Goodness knows they have been waiting a long time for it, and they are going to enjoy it to the fullest. Live in Glenview, I'm Tim Ryan, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Well, maybe